This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I am a writer and film critic and today we're going to be doing something a little bit different because instead of a writer we've got a comedian. Chris Calagero is a comic who has uh, played the clubs in New York, Los Angeles and all over the United States of America. He is also an actor and he has produced a series of uh, videos that I first came across on Twitter of him nailing various movie cliches in a hilarious manner. I'm going to put some links on the show notes so that you can click to his site and see them for yourself. But they've caught the attention not just of me, but people from the New York Times and Funny or Die website. And I think he's a, a really smart guy. I thought it'd be really interesting to have a conversation with him about movies, about his passions, about what inspired him to do these these uh, videos and um, and generally about comedy and, and movies as well so I hope that you enjoy the conversation I'm sure you will and if you do please remember to spread the word on the social media as far and as wide as you can go we're still on Twitter uh, at Dr. John T D-R-J-O-N-T-Y but you can also find me on Instagram and increasingly on threads so have a look for me there uh, as well especially if you can't stomach Twitter, which I fully understand. Before you do that, however, enjoy the conversation. You're in Los Angeles, right? I am. I'm in LA. I've been here for about two and a half years now. And you coming from New Jersey? From Brooklyn, actually. Yeah. So Jersey by way of Brooklyn. Moved there because I moved to New York because because of comedy, basically. Uh, right. And my now wife was had a job in Miami and then she was coming back up. And so we just moved into a place in Brooklyn together. And so you sort of started out in, the co- in New York in the comedy scene before moving out to LA. Yeah. So I started in comedy. My, yeah, I started comedy in New York down in the West Village way back in 2007. So I've been at it for a while. But yeah, I started in New York, which is a funny place to start because, you know, it's like it's like starting a a video game level on on hard. You know, it's just you're just like right in the middle of it. You've got such such incredible competition, I imagine. Well, it's funny because it's like it's it's like it's both. I feel it's both quantity and quality. You have the like you know the best of the best to me in in terms of like pure stand up comedians. But you also have however x amount of people starting every single day in that city uh so it bubbles up quite big for like i feel like the comedy scene goes through like some phoenix moments where it like our supernovas you know it, yeah it expands out really huge and then it comes back in a little bit and then it, it is always like kind of pulsating with people i was in new york now this was a long time ago this was like we went to see spam a lot we did all the tourist things yeah yeah you know how you sort of get the the the, the guys outside on the pavement sort of selling your tickets for comedy gigs oh i i did it i used to do it right well that's it you they're often comedians saying you know oh you might see me there and 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 we went right. and we're, were like three or four comedians in and i was so stupid i'm such an idiot that <laughs> when they sit you down they sort of said you have to buy however many drinks three drinks or something or four drinks yeah as part of the, of you know, you get your ticket and you get three or four drinks or whatever. And I'm such an idiot. I thought you had to buy them all at once. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's not honestly a bad strategy uh, in terms of comedy clubs, because then you can avoid, you know, having to do that awkward, like in the middle of it, like, and like trying to be quiet. So honestly, like you kind of hack the system a little bit. The re- the only reason it was four was because it was two each. And, and, right, uh, two, yeah, and, yep. and Lydia was like, I'm not having a drink. And so I was like, well, <laughs> I guess that's me having to having to take one yep. for the team. Yeah. I mean, four drinks, what would that set you back? Like, uh, like 55, 60 bucks or something? Something. This was back a little while, but um, yeah, it was still. Uh, yeah, I couldn't go on that that long drinking drinking at that place. No, you can't. It, it's like so funny. It's like their their main goal in the end is to sell drinks, 
um, when I started comedy, um, a woman who was, was kind of teaching me uh, was like, you can either become a comedian or you can become a drink salesman, you know, and, um, and comedy clubs are really their bars, you know, they're trying to make money off of that. So it's like, when those guys are selling you tickets, it's like, hey, do you like comedy? And $9 Bud Lights is basically what they're saying. <laughs> the reason I, I wanted to have you on the podcast is I love these films that you did, and they were collected by Funny or Die as well, uh, which was sort of collection of movie cliches. I remember one of them is, they're so well edited as well. They're so well put together. The one about oh, thank sort, you. Of, sort of movies that are desperately begging for for oscar like oscar bait meryl streep style or yeah yeah the oscar bait one. Oh well it's uh, nobody ever references that one it's one of my favorites yeah it's kind of got a little bit of um what uh the uh, imitation game is in there as well i sort of spot a few yeah, <laughs> few references. yeah. that movie always s struck me as like one of the more oscar baiting movies i don't know why it, it's always stuck in my head as a movie that was like just like we did all the stuff like, here's all we did it all. Can we have the award? You know, I don't know why that one in particular, because there's a lot like it. The one thing that gets me about that film as well is that it's so not true in terms of the right. uh, the baddie who's played by Charles Dance, who is like, you know, cheering, you know, what are you doing? You're meddling again. And it's like, no, that guy actually was the guy who put the team together and protected Turing from any outside things. He's actually the good guy and you've made him into a villain because of your screenwriting right. class. I, I mean, maybe it's also, you know, if you cast Charles Dance, he's got to be a villain. So maybe they maybe they just were like, oh man, we, he's got to be, He's got to be a bad guy, but it's also really funny for like a, a movie about a, a um, you know, a mathematician slash scientist uh, to to have kind of an angry chief character in there, which is essentially what he's doing. Right. Which is like, you're you're not playing by the rules. Turing. <laughs> like, uh, uh, it's so silly. Yeah. But that Oscar one is like one of my favorites because they're all pretty context free things. They're not they're They're a bunch of clips that are meaningless unless you know like Oscar bait movies. So I feel like that's uh, a good one to reference because it's like, that's for people who know those kinds of movies. It's all about winning or losing, or it's not about winning or it's not about losing. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like no really through line aside from like, give us an Oscar. I love the, the idea of Charles dance as being the the lieutenant or the sergeant that you get in the cop movies because that's another of your videos that i really like charles dance would be sort of give me your your protractor and your pencil put them on the desk <laughs> <laughs> yeah enigma machine what are we talking about here <laughs> uh, but yeah that was a the the police chief in an action movie that was my first ever one it was like the first video i did and the first video um or the first like thing on Twitter that like did anything for me at all. Like that really went somewhere. And, um, and then I just, I realized I had this big wide knowledge base of having watched, you know, a million movies um, as a kid and teenager and adult that, uh, and my comedy background, I felt like it was just a good mixture of those things combined with a moment on social media where, those things, those kinds of videos were taking off and, and people were enjoying them and and um, you didn't have to be mean or weird or uh, anything else. Just a, a movie lover and a, and a comedian kind of fit the bill there. There's a real warmth to them and an affection. You can tell you really enjoy movies as well. It's not it's not just like, yeah, I don't know, uh, cinema sins or something where it's picking on stuff which... You think, yeah, why does this happen with this? You know, this isn't like you're perfectly capable of going, okay, this is a cliche, but it's it right. I can recognize it and I can riff on it, but without destroying, you know, uh, the films that, that it, it inhabits. Yeah. I mean, I was actually going to reference them too. I, I really don't like their, uh, the way they attack movies because there does not feel like there's a love there so much as a, uh, look at me, look how smart I am kind of thing. And I, I, I don't, there's too many things that that talk about the reasons that they hate stuff and mm. and especially as that gets traction on the internet and I I'm glad that it comes across that I I love those characters. I mean, they're stock cliche characters, but I love them and the beautiful thing about them is so many different wonderful actors have taken those stocks and and made 
great roles out of them and and done great things with them. Um, but they're always there. They're comforting. They're wonderful. They transcend uh, actors, and and I I hope that it always comes through that that these are my guys, man. I love those dudes, especially <laughs> yeah. like action movie guy, like action movie cliches and um all those things. Like I'm such a big fan of of that uh in particular in in the, in action movies in particular. That, I love the fact. Uh, I mean, what was the film that really plays on all the cliches? The other guys, uh, the Will Ferrell. Oh, yeah, the, that yes. that really sort of like the whole thing about uh, the explosion. And, and usually, people are sort of like very you know, brush off an explosion. They're like, "Ah, oh, my eyes, my eyebrows." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the movie's really great at that. That like uh, that and and Hot Fuzz are like a great double feature for like lovingly uh acknowledging um but also playing up the the stereotypes of and cliches from action movies uh because they do attack them with with a with a respect and a love and i, and I appreciate that well i was, did a tweet earlier today about uh, alien romulus and then i felt a bit guilty about it because i was a, it was a similar sort of cinema sins thing and it and you know i've, I've written screenplays in the past and and there's this thing that annoys me a little bit when i see it which is where people establish everybody's relationship in a scene and they go oh yeah <laughs> you know my crazy brother oh get out of here my sister and you know <laughs> and it's like okay but there's another bit of me that goes that's a really economic way of just establishing who everyone is immediately rather yeah than, or you get it in period films uh, like true stories where somebody is like mr gogan meet mr van Gogh. you should you two should get yeah, along yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then Ben goes like, "Ah, oh, talking this year or something," you know, like, <laughs> the, like the foreshadowing too happens. I think that's really funny, but, but yeah, man, I, I, I think the, um, the, the meet the team thing. I mean, I love, I love a, a team of people on, a, on a mission they won't come back from kind of, uh, uh movies or, or um. When I, I did a a, the, a video of like the meet the heist crew, and it's very similar, right? Like I, it's kind of playing on that, uh, which is just you meet the person and they have like five to ten seconds to give you their thing, <laughs> and then it's like out. And I think that happens in in those sci fi action movies a lot, especially the alien movies, which are so contingent on the crew. The crew is like so important in those movies. I haven't seen Romulus yet, but I'm excited now that you even said that. Yeah. It. Oh, yeah. They, oh, you'll definitely enjoy that. There are there are the cliches. You will you will be able to stroke the cliches from your chair. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I mean, there are literally characters who are their haircut. You know, it's just like oh my god, they have yeah. very little about them except they've got you know meet me i'm short hair punk lady <laughs> right 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 uh yeah it's like i mean aliens does that incredibly well when they wake up from the from the cryo sleep and they all they all just are, <laughs> it's like they wake up and they're like oh i gotta be uh the most over the top version of myself right now the staff sergeant which goes back to uh talking about the police lieutenant the staff sergeant actually sort of has a cigar and just puts, puts it in his mouth straight right away. back in yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how you, like that's such a good introduction to the world that you're stepping into. It just makes me think: How did he get into the Cairo prop pod? Like, it was like, and I've got to have my wake up cigar here. Yeah, I like to think that there was like also a little cryopod inside the cryopod that was just cigar sized. That he also like he put the little cigar inside the cryo case and then and then they both opened at the same time cryo humidifier for the, <laughs> yeah for the yeah, yeah so but what was your um you know what what's your you, you your love of movies what was your first sort of experience how, how did you get into them well um yeah my dad i had a uh a dad i have a dad who who um just didn't care if i watched r-rated movies you know so would show like we would see like so many movies and go into the movies every week and was uh it was like important in seeing the new releases because my dad was into them and I just really got into them. And I think, I feel like the one that, uh, that clicked in my brain that was like, Oh, I love movies was he rented raising Arizona when I was a kid and watched it as a new release. And I just remember thinking that like, wow, this is a real life cartoon. And this is, <laughs> it just hit a lot of boxes for a, a kid and and then I was like in and and I would watch you know Raiders of the I was I remember back in the day McDonald's used to give away VHS tapes 
if you wow. went you, or you could buy them for like you buy your meal and you could buy like a tape for like another nine ninety nine. So my dad got um Back to the Future and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I would just wear those those movies out. I would watch them constantly. Uh, so yeah, I just they've always been a part of my life. You know, I, I've always loved them. And then I remember in high school I took a a film course and we made a movie. Uh, me and my friends all made a movie. Uh, together about a police investigation and the cop is the you know the twist is the cop is the guy who did it and he's investigating his own uh murders with his partner and stuff and it actually ends on a uh uh like a john woo like you know standoff and it cuts to black and you don't know what happens we were very we were very excited about that foreshadowing the sopranos as well <laughs> yes yeah yeah we could we could. and it was shot in new jersey so you know uh, yeah, not bad. But yeah, I don't know. I, I I remember the other movie that was formative for me was uh was Reservoir Dogs. When I saw that for the first time at about I don't know, I was maybe fifteen. It like blew my mind that that mm -hmm. this movie existed. Um, I was like, I cannot believe that they make movies like this. Uh, now knowing you know how much influence Tarantino took from so many other films. Uh, but at the time, you know, your entry point is your entry point, and you go whoa like this has to be the first time anybody ever did anything like this and i watched that over and over and over again um so yeah then i was just in man i just that was it i i my dad introduced me to a lot of great movies yeah i still think reservoir dogs is tarantino's best movie i mean it's it's before tarantino was tarantino and so and already Absolutely. with pulp fiction he knows he's tarantino and and that's so. right i mean they, it, pulp fiction is great as well but i just think reservoir dogs has this purity so it's, yes it's absorbing all these things but he doesn't even know that he'll be found out yeah you know it's like he can fool us he as far as he knows it's going straight to video i mean yeah that movie is i mean first of all it's like a character actor heaven in that movie yeah there's a real rawness and a real uh uh this may be my only chance to make a movie quality to it um that really really holds up and really feels uh I mean, it feels very of its time, but also not. It's always weird in that movie where they're, when they're wearing real clothes, because when they're wearing their sort of suits, it's like, this could be the 1950s. And then occasion, and then they're talking about Madonna. It's like, well, OK, it's not the 1950s, right. it's 1990s. And, you know, it's, right. it's, 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 uh, it's so pure. And I love Raising Arizona. I think that's a underrated um, Coen Brothers classic. I it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I partially, you know, the context of of watching with my dad is so young and and it and it um making me it was part of the way, reason I love movies like I said, but it's also so good and so funny and, and Nick Cage is incredible in it and I mean it it is it is like almost a Looney Tunes like a Wile E Coyote movie. You know, it, it is, almost is that vibe going on and it's such a good they create such a good world that you want to you want to go back and visit it. And like they kind of do it again with a lot of specificity. Um, uh, But man, that the world that they established so quickly. Talk about establishing character relationships. That movie does it so incredibly well. I would even like the shopkeeper when, you know, they're buying balloons for the baby. It's like, does it blow up into funny, funny <laughs> shapes? Not unless you find circular funny. <laughs> <laughs> So good, dude. It's, uh, I, I've got lines from that film engraved in my head. I think I must have watched it a thousand times. It's so, it's so good. Oh my God. I was just, yeah, I was just saying, I love, uh, like me and Dottie are swingers, as in to swing. And I say that, <laughs> I say to swing all the time. It's such a dumb line. Lo I love his voiceover in it where he says, um, her womb was a barren place where my seed could find no purchase. And he's just like, how, yeah. the, that's, how the hell did he get that from oh, what man. the doctor was saying? That's I, I, it's one of my favorite Coen Brothers things is um, the yokel with the uh, eloquent uh, uh, dialogue. Is yeah. they, I love that. And they do it in so many different movies. I mean, uh -huh. Oh Brother or Arthur, all three of those guys are speaking in that way. But they're just... Like I said, they're yokels and they talk like uh, they've been like formally educated. Uh, I interviewed Tim Blake um, Nelson recently and he was sort of oh, like, cool. he was saying that his whole career he owes to the Coen brothers because uh, he, he said because they decided to cast gargoyles. 
<laughs> yes, man. That is a we're missing the we got to keep casting the gargoyles, man. I was just talking about this with somebody, you know. We can't lose we can't lose our our um our politely to put it politely, uh, faces full of character <laughs> uh, well, actors, you know. To go back to Alien, I mean, you look at Alien, you got Harry Dean Stanton, uh, you know, um, Yafet Koto, John Hurt, Ian Holm. I mean, they all look very distinctive and dif different. You know, of course, right. Sig Sigourney Weaver, it looks amazing. And Tom Skerritt probably is the only one of a one who's a sort of like an amazing looking guy. But um, in the new one, they look like H&M models. You know, they're all yeah, they're all they're all blandly fairly beautiful i don't want to spoil it for you because i had a lot of fun with it so i'm not um yeah yeah no i'm, I'm excited but i mean I, it's not uh unusual I, and i don't you know i understand the reasoning and i and i don't blame you know any actors who are trying to get ripped you know and, and mm. work out and stuff but um but yeah i i do think that i don't want i hate losing the the guys the the women the the interesting looking people who are not going to be the stars that I, I i got really upset when um and he was great in it uh but colin farrell as the penguin i was like mm. come on that's for an ugly man or give give us a give us somebody with some character and like i i really enjoyed what he did with it i'm sure the tv show will be good but i was like you know you could save on this prosthetics by just casting an uggo you know just yeah, do it i mean uh, richard kind is right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not I mean, saying, but he just looks like Richard Kind. I'm not saying that Richard Kind is an ugly man, but no, no, yeah. And when I say ugly, I mean Hollywood ugly. You know, like these are normal looking people who just <laughs> uh, are able to get roles. You know, um, I I recently watched um, oh, the taking of of uh, Pelham one two three. The oh original. right, and yeah. um, man, that's got some faces in it. Well, I mean, there was a time that Hollywood sort of had you know normal faces or, or people who even could be see, said to be sort of more unusual looking than the average i mean robert mitchum in the friends of eddie coyle or uh humphrey bogart or edward g robinson yeah you know? i mean these guys weren't yeah. like uh you know they weren't cracking mirrors exactly but they weren't uh you know absolutely sort of runway ready right and they, there were those guys i mean there were there was beautiful actors and actresses back then too but but there was like a healthy dose of uh, normal looking guys who also could lead movies and not just be side characters. That's it. Yeah, that's the the idea. Nowadays, we would look at someone like Humphrey Bogart and we go, OK, you could be a, a character actor, certainly. But um, as long as Cal Colin Farrell right. doesn't want to take your role, that is. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming for all of them, man. I do love him. But yeah. Give, give Me too. Break, man. Give, give it was so up. funny when... When they cast him as the penguin, I was like, "Well, that's a new take." Uh, and then I was like, "Oh, well, they're they're just gonna throw a bunch of prosthetics on him." Oh, okay. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. There you go. What What do you think when you watch movies? Is there a, um, a sense that you're looking for inspiration with your comedy? That you you're sort of do you, do you find especially when you're doing your your videos? Is is there a mm -hmm. sense that you're sort of looking for things that oh, that that would be something that that would work? Um, I sure. Good question. I so I haven't I haven't done a lot of the videos uh, lately, but um, I try to not watch things and think of how they can become. Um, I hesitate to use the word content because I hate it, but mm. um, but how they can become something that I could use because I think, and this goes for making, especially these bite-sized things for the internet, which has become a lot of what the internet is in terms of entertainment. Um, but if I force it, it's not going to be anything that I care about. You know, it, right. it'll, I mean, if it does come to me in the middle of something, even if it's a joke or if it's uh, uh, something I want to write or note or, or maybe make a video about, I'll pause it and, and, and take a little note. But I find that if I'm pushing it, then it's, there's a crack in the foundation immediately. Mm, mm, right yeah you're sort of building it on sand if it's got uh, uh you know if you as you say if you're forcing it too much right like i have to think of something i have to i have to make make some hay out of this and then also it takes me out of watching the movie you know it takes it, it'll i'm sure you know like once one part of your brain starts going off on a little trail a little adventure by itself then you're like, wait, who's this guy? Why, why don't they want to give him the the coach to the nuclear football? I can't remember this. <laughs> yeah, you just and, and then it. you have to rewind. <laughs> you yeah, you have to rewind. You have to go back, and then and then you're just like, 
I don't know. And then also um, there's a potential and, you know, I'm bad at this. I'm sure a lot of people are uh, of sometimes just grabbing your phone and being like writing something down and then being like, Ooh, let me play with all the things on here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got to put my phone in a box if I want to watch a movie because it's just like, even if I put it on the other side of the room, I find myself crawling towards the phone. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, dude. I mean, in Netflix, apparently, I was talking to some executive uh, in Switzerland and they were telling me that um, uh, they're actually designing stuff that they call, this is good to, to screening content because you can watch it on two screens at the same time. And, you know, it's almost like, yeah, I've heard this. You design it as radio, essentially. So you don't have to be, there's nothing visually you have to be watching while you're, while you're watching. Right. Right. And I, I find that it's quite, it's a bummer to, to think of things like that because I think they have plenty of shows in reality TV and things that are trashy that, you know, I will have an edible and watch with my wife and, you know, mock and, and do all those things. And, and I think there's something about the, uh, the folding laundry shows, you know, they doing some chores and having something on, but I think to, to seek it out and make it, especially as a movie is a bummer. I mean, it's, you know, there's so many things that streaming seems to not understand about the way that people want to enjoy movies um and that is certainly one of them i mean you know paramount doesn't even put the movies out anymore so i mean the thing with movies the one worst one for me in netflix is when they throw up uh, what to watch next when the titles are going up it's like i don't want to watch anything next i just watched a movie i want to see the credits you know it's like so ungrateful i know it is a, yeah they really they I, I, the uh and I, I had to turn off the uh the thing where it just starts playing something else which oh, is right. like, or like you're watching TV and uh, an episode of TV on that and there and it just shoots right to the next episode. And you're like, give me a break, man. Even if I do want to watch it, you know, I'll choose it. I got to go use the restroom. I got to get another drink. I, you know, this like, they're just like driving you to sit there and watch. And, and I get it to a certain degree, but man, it feels real um, clockwork orangey. <laughs> yeah, clock. And I loved your uh, you, the piece you did about the guy who misapplies George Orwell to everything. This is oh, so yeah. Orwellian. This is why is it <laughs> my toast is burnt. What this is like a dystopia by George Orwell. <laughs> yeah, man. The, one of the most misunderstood books of all time at this point, maybe. Yeah, well, he he said Big Brother was like going to be this scary thing to avoid but apparently you queue up around the block to get it on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude yep 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 we worship worship it now and like you gotta go you gotta hop online and defend all the billionaires man who else is gonna do it i i know especially musk i i don't i mean walter isaacson wrote a biography of um leonardo da vinci a biography of einstein a biography of steve jobs already there you're beginning to push it walter you're beginning yeah, to push yeah. your genius definition and then he writes a biography of musk i mean come on man he Oof. must be he must be embarrassed about that now i wonder yeah i i i wonder if i mean i feel like a lot of people got suckered in at first to the to the Musk thing, and but to write a whole book, I mean, goodness gracious! There comes a point where you you would be think you would be putting down your pencil and go, "Come again," you know, you. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just like like staring up at the wall, like at the ceiling in the middle of the night, just have just like, what am I doing? It's like a Tenacious D song where they sing about you know the future, and they're going like, you know, we'll travel in tubes, <laughs> and it's like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's Elon Musk, isn't it? Like tunnels, it is, it tunneling, is tunneling under the floor. He he built a tunnel i that was like the, i remember when the, the tunnel thing was happening i was like i felt it i was like is are we being gaslit to think that tunnels like didn't exist i mean we have the movie daylight for, for, for christ's sake it's all about tunnels <laughs> there's that bit in blade runner where he's thinking about he's going through one and you hear the gunshot come on we've had tunnels for young yeah i was like i was like okay the, to me it almost felt like a, an experiment of like how much do you love me i'm going to make a tunnel and like will you defend this and people were like absolutely we will go to war for your tunnel oh, no, I'd, I'd love to know now that he owns x uh slash twitter it's it's really difficult to tell if anybody actually likes him anymore because it's uh because it's there. And I've really, really had this, especially with the riots in the UK and his sort of comments, 
I really sort of wanted to leave Twitter, but I feel so bad because I've got 12,000 followers and I want to keep them. I don't want to go I to know. threads and have 1,000 followers. I know, I know. It's such a bummer. I mean, he really he really tanked it. And, and talking about meeting people, like I've, like I've met so many wonderful people on there. And uh, and I felt the same way. But um, I, I don't know if it was somebody was just talking about how like leaving X or Twitter is not going to hurt them like everything's going to proceed the same way so you might as well just stay on it and i don't think there has been like a better alternative i mean everybody hopped on threads but i never i rarely go over there or blue sky or any of these other places um because I'm... it still doesn't have the vibrancy no i agree i agree i'm trying to do a bit more on threads and seeing if i can build it up and see what happens but it just means i sort of feels like i'm doubling my work and it fe- and it feels like work, which it shouldn't do, really. I know, I know, and it didn't before, and now it does. You know, mm-hmm. I've I've uh, my album coming out. I've promoted it on all the things, and I put it on one thing, and then I close that, and I go over to another, and I put it on there, and I close that, and I go to another, and I put it on there, and I'm like, well, this is it's it's too much. But I mean, some people did leave Twitter. Some people just left. So. uh you know, you want to try to try to meet people where they are, too. Totally agree. And I think that's the thing is if you have something to promote, you know, like your album or my podcast, for that matter, for this this podcast, yeah. it will be. I, You know, that's that's the only advertising I have is is social media. It's not it's I'm not going to be gluing up billboards anytime soon. So, um, right, right. Listen, let's stop talking about our own social media woes because uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's about, it's about it's supposed to stay on the computer. It's about first, yeah, yeah. What happens on the internet stays on the internet. So, yeah. what's well, um, you are a horror fan as well. I see you got your Overlook Hotel app on. Oh, yeah. I try to wear like a, a movie hat if I do a movie podcast, but uh, but yeah, I, horror movies. I love horror movies, those are like that's my favorite. Um, I really, when I was a teenager, so I like, we were talking about getting into movies. I got into yeah. movies. Um, when I was a kid too, my uncle uh, always had horror movies going and and I saw them way too young. Um, a lot of Friday the 13th that I saw uh, very young. And then when I was a teenager, it felt like, it felt cool to watch, especially like to go through old horror movies and watch them and feel like I was doing something illicit by by watching these especially like 70s exploitation movies and um really hardcore horror movies me and my friends would watch them i worked in a video store so we would i would rent out three videos actual videotapes at a time that i could watch uh and then we would go to another video store and then pick out our favorite covers of uh horror movies that uh we would then watch so yeah horror is like very important to me what were some of those uh, early ones that you watched that were? Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember some that I never watched, but I remember the covers really well. I remember the Exterminator yeah. with the welding mask and the blow. Yeah, I, and I only really recently, like two or three years ago, I sort of found it on the internet and watched it and thought, oh, "That's okay." But in my head, it was going to be like, "Oh man, they drop him into a mincing machine." <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. I I that's the thing I miss is like is the covers especially the covers of horror movies they would really really go for it but uh i remember there was a i don't know if do you remember maxim magazine it was kind of like a cheesecake men's you know it was always like a woman on a bikini yeah uh so they did uh they would actually have some good movie coverage and they put out a list of like 25 um b movies to watch you know and we took we ripped that out of the thing and we started watching all of them. Um, so we watched stuff like uh, I Spit It On Your Grave, which was is a brutal movie. Uh, it's like a rape revenge uh, exploitation movie. We watched that when we were 17. And we I remember me and these the other guys watching just kind of silently like got up as the credits rolled and we're like, all right, uh, see you later. Like it just <laughs> it was just oh, like, not- have a bath. <laughs> my yeah. mother tell her i'm sorry i spit on your grave isn't that the one with the really inappropriate sort of like folksy theme song oh, it might be it's got a real sort of like um you know sunshine and flowers sort of oh it like, might be yeah yeah you know it lovely might... drip, drippy drops of rain uh, right because they just... really want to hammer home the innocence of this woman right yeah, yeah. yeah they're sort of like hippies on their way to new york for a concert or something that might be Last House on the Left? 
Oh, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yes, Last yeah. House on the on the left. Yes, of course. Yeah, which is also a, a brutal a brutal movie. Um, yeah, um, yeah. We watched those, and we watched. Uh, uh, then we got into a little bit of Argento with like Suspiria and and uh, I think a movie called Three Sisters. Uh, but yeah, name of of that Argento movie now. But yeah, uh, but we watched all those bloody movies. The, I think the one that most upset me from that era was um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as that's the one that stuck with me. And I watched that way too young. Yeah, that, I mean, that movie is is vicious. It is really, and it, talk about, <laughs> like, talking about Tarantino making Reservoir Dogs. I mean, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is like, everything is, he puts everything into that movie. Um, and obviously they squeeze as many resources as they could um, uh, down to the bone. But man, that is a another like I may never make a movie, so I'm going to make the most horrifying movie. And, and I feel like that movie has the so many movies like take from that movie. Absolutely. I think that movie taught me something as well about like how you kill people in terms of how you kill people on screen is that you don't need to do anything blood wise or anything. It's just like uh, the foot of a guy who's been hit on the head sort of spasming. That's the thing that sort oh, of man. scares the shit out of you, you know? Absolutely. Or even like the the that that big metal door whipping open, mm. being grabbed and then closed is a horrifying image. Uh, even to watching it today, that, that movie freaks me out. It's it, it, I will never be safe in front of that film. Yeah, no, that, that movie is 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 rough. I remember oh. also they, they put out, it was one of those movies where they kept putting out different editions of DVDs, you know? Like, horror has this happen all the time, <clears throat> all the time, where there's like a, somebody gets the rights, and the rights are always moving around, and then people are putting out their versions of the DVDs. But I had one <laughs> where... The DVD cover looked like um, a package of ground beef. So like it was like a picture of like like packaged ground beef. And it was such a disgusting DVD cover for some reason. It's not like bloody or anything, but it's just meat. Because of the because of the butcher who's by basically selling it at the, you know, at the little petrol station that's. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Sort of barbecue meat and stuff. I actually went around Texas and found all those places um oh you did yeah yeah i mean the house they've moved the house is now like a, a fairly you know bijou restaurant bar but they have all the memorabilia and everything uh and it's uh, oh that's but, cool but i found the barbecue place the the sort of the petrol station place as well and that was that was kind of fun and it is kind of a creepy barbecue place out in the middle of nowhere and so i sort of looked around i believe it i couldn't find anyone and decided i'll take a selfie and then i'll i think i'll <laughs> yeah. yeah dude middle of texas is a scary place this is the beginning of my own horror movie yeah i've driven through that entire state and it it can get pretty bleak well i was going to ask this do you do a lot of traveling with your comedy uh, i haven't done a ton uh, I'll, I'll be in albuquerque at the end of this month uh doing some headlining sets i've done a little bit and and i've driven across the country uh two different times um and i've done a lot of shows and stuff in the midwest um and things but i'm hoping after the album comes out to to do a little more traveling though i i gotta say like uh comedy clubs are not that appealing to me um right. for all all that they have the connotations so i'd rather be able to do shows that i set up you know and going back to the horror then um uh, the, yeah. the, the sort of cliches that i mean horror is full of cliches and it's full of really oh my god so full of it what what's your what's your sort of favorite uh horror movie cliches that you that you kind of spot? Oh, I mean, um <clears throat> I love uh I love the character who excitedly talks about the people who have been butchered. Mm -hmm. You know, as it, like if, like especially like in in high school slashers, the the person who like breaks the news that somebody died and they have no compassion when, when they're saying it. It's just Oh, oh it's, my god, did just, you hear what happened to Deirdre? Yeah, yeah, it's the best. It's like, that's my favorite. It's one of my favorites. I did a video about this, but the disgusting coroner is one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> the, the guy eating. who's like eating a sandwich, like, and there's bodies and he's disgusting and, and everything is like out of order. And, and, and he's like, the cops are looking for like one specific thing. And he's just like going through stuff while like bodies are over there. Um, then there's the cousin to that is like the horny, uh, the horny like EMT, you know? who was like whoa <laughs> she was hot you know there's a lot of sexual weird cliches in in horror movies because it's so tied to to um to like sex and sexual exploitation and 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 violence and and all that stuff so 
Uh, it's always, I mean, so many of the cliches are guy people who have seemingly no ability to have tact in a, in a situation <laughs> where somebody has just been brutally murdered. Oh, one of the cliches I, I always think is funny from, uh, from anything that is procedural is when they're uh, is when they're doing something which is really highly unusual but they it, but it's like put the cassette in that we always play when we're doing this and you know and and, and it's usually because a beginner is there and like oh what are we yeah, doing yeah. strap up you know and, and yeah 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 the biggest example of this i've got is philip seymour hoffman in the original twister is like they're going to chase a hurricane and not hurricane a twister and in order to show how sort of laid back they are about it they have their yeah. own song and it's all very rock and roll and it's like piss off even if i was it was my 20th you know storm i would still be like oh this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be scary <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> No, I love it. And you're right. It's always for the benefit of like the new person, the, the Jamie Gertz or something who happens to be there. Uh, it's yeah, I love that, too. And that's such a good one. Um, I also love the guy in a, in a horror movie who uh, just comes in midway through and has the answer to everything. Oh, like, like an exposition dump. sort of. yeah, it's just it. like he he's like, what did you guys do? Oh, you went in the basement and you played the music box. And then when you played the music box, you didn't say the little three words after it. And now, of course, everybody's dying. And he's like mad at you for not knowing this for some reason. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, what, haven't you been to the occult library the way I right. have? Right. And, and then he... Uh, gives his crucial he gives that information and then he gives the crucial information about how to win uh, how to defeat this thing and then he gets killed yeah he has to be killed because he's such a smart ass and we he can't, yeah, he have... can't have him running around no no he's, he's going to be too helpful it's, i think yeah Pol poltergeist has someone like that as well poltergeist as someone turns up halfway through and says oh well of course this right the yeah, i haven't seen poltergeist in a minute but you're absolutely right but yeah it's a it's a mostly like a, a lot of it is like a haunting or a possession movie where it has that character i mean it's, it's a bit weird at the moment because all the there's a, a whole stream of horror movies which are made uh, about characters who themselves have seen horror movies i mean i guess the scream franchise is a, was the beginning of that but yeah uh, you know cabin in the woods and you know uh th there's loads of people who are going oh no okay this is what should happen now because this this is what happens in a horror movie yeah the meta character i mean scream introduced that and did it the best and then i mean it's similar to i was going to say this about reservoir dogs and you, you talking about the scene where they're they're talking about madonna like this scene to me that launched probably like a hundred terrible meta scenes in screenplays that never got made uh or some that did get made but it inspires people to do the same and i and i i felt that um that that was so cool and scream and then it becomes a little less cool with every iteration of it right yeah. but a movie that actually does that before scream that's west craven's movie is uh, a new nightmare which is extremely meta right the the which is in the nightmare on elm street series right yeah it's that it's out it's uh about the real characters but apparently you know freddy was based on some legend and uh, and then they're fighting him in in um in ostensibly real life, uh, which is cool. And it didn't have the impact that Scream had, but Wes Craven was was poking around the edges of the, of the horror genre just a few years before. I always think it's really weird how a lot of these horror films, especially in their first iteration, are sort of kind of you know have at their heart a real darkness, and then as the sequels come on, they become very playful sort of superhero uh, films, you know, where they're, they are super anti-hero films. Because I in the first uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy's like this child murderer. It's like it's not yeah, it's you know it's like, and then in the second and third, he's already this like kind of oh freddy you know? <laughs> yeah he's a, he, he he becomes a real rascal yeah. you know it, it, you uh it's yeah that first nightmare is is it's 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 he's a brutal character um uh, but a great a great creation and then the next thing you know he's he's quipping he's constantly quipping in these movies and um and you are like eh. and then the characters progressively become less likable that he's killing 
I feel mm. like because you're just you, they kind of know the audience is now rooting for Freddy, which then leads up to something like Dexter, where you have a serial killer, the contortions that that have to go into Dexter to make it him oh sort of like, God. oh, he's an anti-hero hero. He's a hero anti-hero. It's like, this, oh, come on, man, that, the serial killer that kills fun. serial killers. Yeah, oh, it's such a stupid idea. I mean. I mean, I watched the first season, but I was like, oh, this is so bad. I mean, it's good, but it's bad. Yes, I felt the same. I, I think I watched the first like season or two. And then, you know, it is by the time, you know, three seasons or two after two seasons, <laughs> you know, it's just Dexter being like, you know, full of blood and on his all his clothes. And he's just like, oh, making a cake <laughs> is tough. And you're like, all right, what's <laughs> happening here? You know. How does nobody know? I was cutting the lawn and I ran over a <laughs> rabbit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, the scene in uh, in Zodiac where John Carroll Lynch is like, those knives I use to kill chickens. And you're like, nobody asked you about that, man. Like, that's a, you don't have to explain it if nobody asked you. Oh, I love when he turns up and it's sort of, especially the ending where he sort of, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's character goes in to sort of get a look at him and he just gives him a look. And oh. it's just the most terrifying thing ever. Um, I know. I, John, I mean, I, part, part of me is, if John Carroll Lynch carries a weight of a of a nice guy, you know, to me in into his roles, you know, partially from Fargo, but he's the helpful neighbor in my in my eyes, the way he seems, the way he's always played characters. And so to see him play ostensibly a zodiac suspect. Um, but yeah, I, that look at the end, I I don't know how he curls his face into that um look, but it's so amazing. It is. It's ab- absolutely uh I mean, and you you're absolutely right. His as Marge Gunderson's husband in Fargo, he's he's the nicest guy in the world. He gets up to make her a breakfast because he oh you're yeah. gonna need a breakfast. You're gonna need a breakfast, Marge. You know. Yeah, he's the guy, and he you know he's trying to create a a painting for a ten cent stamp, and like he's just like this beautiful, sweet Midwestern man. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous characterization. Again, everything comes back to the Coen sooner or later. I know they're my, they are my, they are uh, my, I think my favorite overall filmmakers. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've made so many good films that it, it, it's almost baffling when you get to, you know, Oh, and there's that one. You forgot, you forget them. And although there's this thing about the Coen brothers movie, there are films that just don't fit in with that as well. You know, No Country for Old Men. It's it doesn't yeah. strike strike me. It's not a Coen Brothers movie. It strikes me as a just a movie movie. It, it, yeah, no, I agree. Know. I agree. I mean, they, I think they put uh, some of their yeah. touch into it, um, especially with a lot of the eccentricities that the characters have, like fit in well with their world. But yeah, I mean, they and they they went out of their way to say that they just basically filmed the book as much as they could yeah yeah well it was i mean the book combat mccarthy's novel was initially a screenplay and then he couldn't get it made as a or sell it as a screenplay so he turned it into a book and if you read the book it's just like he said she said with lots of dialogue it's not um, yeah it's not done much to make it into a novel and uh it's brilliant it works <laughs> that's yeah no absolutely i mean uh talking about cliches that you know in in terms of uh cliches you love or, or taking them and reworking them. Um, I think the Coen brothers do that with Miller's Crossing. I mean, that mm. in the hands of uh, another people, that's a pretty run of the mill um, gangster flick, but they take all the, all the gangster movie cliches and just Coen them up like crazy. And then you get something different, familiar, but different, you know? Yeah. What's the rumpus? Even all the, the language has this sort of beautiful, um uh they i talked to one of them Ethan, oh cool i think it was and he said the reason they I, I don't think this was an original thing i think he told a lot of people this but one of the reasons they did um miller's crossing uh was they wanted to do a dashiell hammer book i had heard this but they weren't there, there wasn't a dashiell hammer book which was actually sort of convertible into a movie you know or was you know it was so it was easier for them to just write something in the style of dashiell hammer rather yeah. than to do another version of red harvest or to do a version of the glass key or something like that right right and they had already been made and it's then they're looking at like like they're remaking something but yeah exactly yeah yeah Oh so, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that that movie is outstanding. Yeah, it's one of my favorites, and Gabriel Byrne as well is so good in that. It's like, oh, he's incredible at, at his sexiest. I mean, I, I, quite, I... <laughs> yeah, he's good, man. And and uh, Turturro, I love him in that movie. The the look into your heart. 
<laughs> the beg begging for his life. I mean, again, such a cliche, but the way Turturro just like goes for it is, uh, I, again, another great character actor um, taking something and just making it, taking a cliche and making it their own. Beautiful. I love those extremes as well that they go to. So as you say, you know, just absolutely going for it, absolutely having, not not holding anything back. Right, right. Especially um, the juxtaposition of like Gabriel Byrne keeping everything cool, calm and inside. And then this other guy letting every emotion and thought in his head just stream. And also uh, everything he thinks will help him stream out of him is uh, watching them interact is it is so fascinating in that scene because Gabriel Byrne gives like nothing away. He's got just got the brim of his hat pulled mm -hmm. down so tight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a, and that that's I'm a really I'm really anti sort of screenwriter manuals and things because I look at that film and I say, Where's Gabriel Byrne's arc? And I, what does he learn in that movie? I mean, he doesn't it's learn true. anything. He's just like I mean, he doesn't kill him and then he kills him. I mean, that's yeah. that's I guess that's the only thing, but it's not like he's a different person or or he loses right. his calm at any point, you know. It's true. That's really true. Yeah, I mean, the, I feel like the Coen brothers are, uh, their screenplays are anti a lot of structural um, or uh, screenwriter manual ideas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as as they should be, damn it. <laughs> yeah, you know, like the, 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 you have Raising Arizona and then, you know, this is, a, you know, this, the plot is pretty straightforward. And then all of a sudden enter the hell rider and okay. Now who, what are we doing? Who has the same tattoo as our <laughs> hero? For, yeah. for, for apparent reason. Right, right, right. But Thanks. also just a, a demon, a literal, like, like black evil character. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean that film as well. You, you're like 20, 30 minutes in before the credits. Oh man. I love that. Yeah. That cold open. Yeah. With the going to jail and that, um, yeah, that, I I love when that hits. T turn to the right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to print him, Ned. So good. Another thing I wanted to ask you about as well, as a sort of comedian who's watching movies, has a love for movies. There's been there's a there's a definite sort of um, on ramp to cinema careers from the world of of comedians. You know, you think of Robin Williams and. Jim Carrey and all. Well, who are your favorites uh, in that world of the people who uh, comedians, comics who have made careers in in as film? Um, yeah, uh, great question. I mean, Robin Williams is is uh, first and, and foremost. I think uh, for the even for the hit and miss of his career, um, which mm. is pretty wildly fluctuating. But uh, actually, really love what Bill Burr has done uh, for his um, his career. Uh, he's a great stand up and. Um, but and I think I think this I think comedians have trouble with this because they maybe want to be they want to lead some comedies or they want to um, be bigger stars in the world of TV or movies. But I feel like Burr has realized that there's a niche to be filled for the character actor um, and that he, he looks a specific way. He can act a specific way. And he's like beautifully like nestled himself into a niche that. um that he can translate into from, you know, uh, I think the Mandalorian, which he was in to uh, a movie like the heat. And then, you know, the Pete Davidson, the King of um, uh, Staten Island. So like he's been in such a wide variety of movies because he's settled into such a good niche. And, and I find like that career really inspiring. He's going to be in Glen Gary, Glen Ross. I'm not sure if that's a, a Broadway or it or... is. Yeah. It's on Broadway. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, and right. I feel yeah, and I feel like he's worked his way into something like that, uh, learning how to act by understanding what makes you watchable, you know? Um, it's hard to do. It has that, having that distinctiveness as well that I think he has is a, a really, yeah. you know, sort of distinctive but flexible, you know, sort of see him and you get him straight away. But right. you, might, you might even think, is that Bill Burr? Because you, cause you're right. taken with the character. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder who he's playing in Glengarry. I, I, I uh... I, I would mention the Dead Harris role. That I, yeah. I was exactly that, but just because of the physical um, similarity, it might, it might not be. It could be, but uh, Ed Harris' role strikes me as the right kind of stature as well. For, right. I mean, also in terms of how many lines he's getting and the the, the stature of everyone else in the cast. Yeah, 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 and also like Ed Harris gets so fired up for some mm -hmm. a couple scenes in that movie, and I feel like 
that again burn like that's what that's where he, he lives he lives in such a good place um and yeah it's hard to it's also hard to quantify what to it's hard to look at yourself from the outside and see what the world sees sometimes and then be able to use that to find good roles for yourself does that make yeah. sense yeah yeah exactly see what you have to offer and not not just sort of like i can do anything yeah because you're the instinct is i can do i want to do that i want to be the star i want to do this i want to uh, yeah yeah uh, but it takes a lot of like um self-awareness and, and a little bit of like humbling yourself to understand how you're perceived and still maintain um you know the possibilities you don't want to sort of ruin yourself for comedy either you know you want to have uh right go back to that as well whenever you uh whenever you can i mean i i was joking um I'm, when i was suggesting some things in the email i was joking about andrew dice diceman <laughs> yeah. andrew dice clay andrew dice clay i don't know where i get diceman from oh luke reinhardt it's a novel isn't it i was thinking of andrew dice clay but then again he shows up in a star is born and he's actually really really good right right i, I mean i think He's a good example, though, of like of a, a a a person who had the pop culture in the palm of his hand for a second, and decided to make the Adventures of Fort Fairlane. God, you know, yeah, yeah. and it's a huge bomb, and it kills his career. Uh, I mean, obviously, there was a shelf life on the comedy he was doing, but he had he had cultural cachet. Yeah, and yeah. it really is. I wouldn't tell anybody, you know, where to spend something like that, but you would be very well served to it's hard because you're a star but you'd be better served to find a great director and say i would love to be a side character in a movie that you make rather than hey write me a vehicle yeah because yeah, but it's hard to who's going to who's going to turn down a starring vehicle i don't know yeah i mean even peter sellers who's let's face it a better actor than andrew dice clay um, well, by a, maybe, oh. <laughs> no, no, no. but I mean, the disaster that was Casino Royale was partly because he didn't want to parody James Bond. He wanted to be James Bond. Right. He, right. he wanted, you know, he wanted to be sexy and Brit Eklund and all the rest of it. And he was, you know, you look at those black and white comedies he made in England and he's playing sort of middle aged. He's playing who he is, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit older than he is, but sort of middle aged, dumpy little guys and nobodies and, you know, and in a great way, in a wonderful way. And then you hit the 60s and the 70s and he wants to be, you know, svelte and, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the hero, the lead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I, I don't begrudge him, but I, it, it's hard. It's, it's very difficult. And I, and I think, um, like talking about John Carroll Lynch carrying carrying a, a perception of himself into movies, um, comedians especially, uh, some of the excellers in that moment, uh, but Burr, you you do carry the weight of of being a funny man mm. uh, into things, and you know it it fair or unfair in an audience is sometimes has trouble separating that out. If you're gonna all of a sudden try to be a sexy star in a movie, I mean the weight of your context follows you. And, yeah, and that that can be a blessing or a curse. Who are you? Who are you looking at the in the comedy scene at the moment that you are your sort of the people you admire most? Who are doing um, the people? I well, I really love uh, Mark Maron um, for the way that he resurrected his career, but also the way that um, I loved his last special. I don't know if you've seen it, um, yeah. but I I really really loved it. I felt like it was a really perfect distillation of where he's come from, where he is and where he's going. Um, and so I really love that. And then my, one of my all time favorites is Paul F. Tompkins. He has a comedy career that I, I really, really admire, which is that, you know, he put out a bunch of stand up albums and he did stand up and, you know, he was on, he's been in TV and movies and, and written sketches, but he also has transitioned into being just very silly and fun and character based and I find that to be really appealing because he lives in a lot of worlds, uh, but nothing feels forced with him. What about in the past? Who have you, who are the people that maybe even got you, inspired you to actually get into the game? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny now, but when I was a, a teenager, it was very much Bill Hicks albums, which... I don't think have aged that well. I mean, I I, I, I saw him I live him. in I saw him live in Liverpool, and he was oh really yeah yeah. So one well, I think it must have been definitely his last tour. Um, but 
but yeah, he was he I, he was amazing, I, and I loved his stuff. But I, I, t it's kind of almost like he pushed that shock jock button really incredibly well, and a lot of people dived in, who yes. who weren't as good, and you know, and some stole his material, Mister Leary. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's so funny because he, he did push that button. You're right. But I find, you know, one of his jokes that I, I love so much is uh, envelope pushing jokes. It jokes. It's uh, two moths flying to the sun being like, it's going to be worth it, man. Like, I love because <laughs> I love I think like sometimes, you know, you want them to be personal and truthful, but sometimes you just want people to be funny and people to be uh, let their guard down and uninhibitedly be silly. And and that's like, that's the thing. And, and I find it a bummer when comedians try to be cool. I don't just, we're, it's not a thing. Don't, don't try to be cool. Stop, stop standing away from the thing and having an affectation about it. I don't, I don't love that. But, uh, but Hicks, that being said, Hicks was very important to me because I didn't know that anybody could make money being that way. Like, I didn't know you could do that. Um, and then Patton Oswalt was a was another big one. Um, I bought his albums uh, when I was young too, and um, so yeah, th those were important guys to me to uh, and also like you know I I did my homework you know I did Carlin and Hicks and 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 Pryor and all, and all those guys um, and they were I loved them too. Um, but yeah, I mean I used to just go to the record store and flick through comedy CDs and then buy like two or three at a time. Yeah, I remember listening to, I mean, I know that, again, it's a, it's a name that perhaps has not um, worn well, but Woody Allen's uh, stand-up. Uh, I had a double album of his, and um, mm -hmm. it was, you know, the whole thing about the deer and the hunting season and all that sort of stuff. It's just some some of the best. I, there's a joke that he has on on there, which um, is, uh, I, 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 uh, I was playing vibes at a party and a woman came up to me and she says, Hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm playing vibes. And she said, why are you playing vibes? Said, ah, it helps me to sublimate my sexual tension. And she says, I know a way of sublim. I also know a way of sublimating sexual tension. And I go, Oh, gee, a girl who also plays vibes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like, you can't sit here and pretend that that Woody Allen wasn't funny, you know. Oh my it's... God, he was great. I mean, he is he... he is great. I mean, I'm not going to go into the the whole thing because nobody can know. So right. I'm not not going to argue the merits of it here. No, but no, no, no. But I totally under I totally understand you. The the jokes, the, the his prose, his short stories, and uh, his stand up, I think is it's kind of like probably the, his least known of of uh, uh, of of his many talents, as many things that he's done yeah yeah it, it definitely did um get forgotten i mean there are there are those guys who who use stand up um as a jumping off point and then kind of never really go back to it much um mm -hmm. or ever again i mean eddie murphy i think recently came out and and said that stand up is just not a thing that he cares to do ever again and when i started and i don't know if this was always going on there was always a rumor that that eddie murphy was gonna start doing stand up again Right, and right. oh he's gonna he's gonna be doing stand-up he's gonna be doing stand-up and i think eddie is eddie murphy is such a he's a very weirdly to me self-possessed guy like he he's very seemingly happy with the way that his career and life is going has gone he doesn't ever seem to he does he does what he wants when he wants yeah i auditioned for that new beverly hills cop movie oh really what, yeah, what yeah. happened what was uh... i i mean i didn't i didn't get it but i, I it was one of, i it was the biggest thing i ever auditioned for oh wow oh wow yeah. oh man you i hope you uh, what is that something you're looking for in the future you're looking to to get into the movies i would love to yeah it's a real yeah. it's a real dream of mine um yeah. you know the album coming out was a was a real dream and and uh, i'm going to have that being coming coming out so my next real like the thing that i really really would love is to to get into a movie i think it'll happen i'm i'm pretty sure I'm, I'm manifesting it i'm manifesting thank you it. even though i had a friend recently who told me about manifesting and she said um uh what you have to do is lie on a bed and manifest that there's money on the ceiling and i was like <laughs> i was like um okay so couldn't you do you have to manifest there's a ladder as well <laughs> yeah you, you <laughs> get the money you do or or something with a with like one of those sticky ends on it you just <laughs> get off yeah um, yeah, I had a person tell me that the the way to manifest was right before you go to sleep, you think of 
a, a moment that you want to happen and you do that for like six weeks. But... Well, that's too long before going to sleep, surely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. That's what I said. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I just think maybe planning and, and sort of doing stuff, writing letters, sending your CV and your headshots might oh be God. better. I know. I think it would actually be better to just talk walking around Hollywood with like a 500 headshots and, sh and shower and going to parties and bumping into people <laughs> and all that, all that stuff, the hard work, the, the, the shoe leather. Yeah, absolutely. I'm honestly going to parties and meeting people is, is a good way to do it. Yeah. I, I've got all my best jobs from, uh, from basically mingling with people in yep. uh, when they're drunk yep. and getting, getting them, charming them and getting them. To absolutely. Be not on purpose, but you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> just, Sometimes it just happens. Brilliant, Chris. Well, uh, when's the album out? Let, let, and, and what's the title so that uh, our listeners can uh, can get it? Uh, the album is out August 29th, and it is called Husky Boy. Husky Boy. Wonderful. And yeah, I've listened to it already. I really loved it. I really loved the thing about different bits of your body that you're allowed to touch, which was... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> One of many bits uh, uh, that I enjoyed. And if you haven't Thank had you. the opportunity of... Uh... Um, you you should follow Chris on Twitter at at real Chris Cal. There you go, and you will find some of his. Uh, I'll I'll put a link up on the show notes as well. Uh, oh, but thank it, you. It's been a real joy talking to you, Chris. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, John. This is awesome. I could I could uh, talk to you about movies all day. Mm -hmm.